Hello everyone, thank you for checking out this video. Firstly, I would just like to say, if you are here looking for an update on Bloodlines 2, I don't have one. This video is really just an excuse for me to go over the events leading to the current Bloodlines 2 situation and put forward my own perspective on those events, and to express my own thoughts and speculation on the Bloodlines 2 situation as it stands. Secondly, I want to make it abundantly clear that all views expressed in this video are purely my own and are not based on any information gained from anyone currently or formerly working at Paradox Interactive or Hard Suit Labs. And so, with that little disclaimer out of the way, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2, a game which is apparently still in development despite not actually having a developer, not sure how that works but my suspicion would be badly, is at this point more than one year overdue from its original release date and currently has no set release date of any kind. But apart from that, it's all going fantastically well. So how did we end up in this glorious situation? After all, it started well enough. A few months before the official announcement, we started to hear rumours of an upcoming Worlds of Darkness reveal, and naturally speculation began to build. This was followed by the release of the Tender app as a marketing gimmick. Personally, while I was interested in what was going on, my expectations weren't exactly very high. I'd figured at best we might get a remastered version of Bloodlines 1, or some other minimum effort entry. I guess I can just go back to calling it Bloodlines now, because I really don't think we're getting a sequel. Now I should say here in hindsight, a remake of the game was probably more realistic than a remastered version, primarily due to the sheer age of the game, but at the time, the concept of a remake or a sequel to the game never even crossed my mind, not well over a decade after the release of Bloodlines. Finally, on the 21st of March 2019, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 was officially announced. At what can be best described as a poorly staged and rather awkward reveal event in Seattle. Not that that did anything to curb the fans' speculation and enthusiasm. Following the announcement, like many fans of the original game, I was shocked but happy to see a return to the Worlds of Darkness. After all, I loved the first Bloodlines game and was a long time player of the Worlds of Darkness tabletop RPGs. I don't know what it was exactly, but something kept nagging at the back of my mind. Maybe it was the horribly disappointing 5th edition of Vampire the Masquerade, which in my opinion all but destroyed the setting in its entirety, or the ridiculous controversies that had accompanied it. Maybe it was the memory of CCP Games' failed Worlds of Darkness Online, or something else entirely, I don't know. All I know for certain is this. When everyone else was becoming more enthusiastic for Bloodlines 2, I was becoming more and more concerned and sceptical by the day. In the weeks that followed, I remember deciding to look up Hard Suit Labs, and being a little concerned. Sure, it looks fairly decent at first glance, but looks can be deceiving. Hardsuit have some 25 games listed on their website. Some of them I've even heard of. But how many of those games do you think Hardsuit are actually listed as developers on? I'll come back to that shortly. One of the main things that struck me when I looked at Hardsuit Labs was that of those 25 games, not a single one excluding Bloodlines 2 was an RPG. In fact, the closest I could get to an RPG was Bioshock Infinite, and that's not exactly a very close match. The situation worsens significantly when you look at the actual work that Hardsuit did on these games. It becomes quite apparent that Hardsuit have done a great deal of optimization, engineering support and console ports, but have extremely limited experience of developing their own titles. In fact, of those 25 games listed, Hardsuit are only actually the developers on three. They are the co-developers of Smite, the developers of Blacklight Retribution, a game which is by almost all accounts notable only for how mediocre it is, and the developers of Bloodlines 2. Yes, that's right, to get them up to three, you need to count Bloodlines 2 as well. So like I said, limited developmental experience. As time passed, like many people who'd been initially sceptical of the game, I started to feel a little more optimistic. After all, Brian Mitsoda was the lead narrative designer, one of the key figures behind Bloodlines... success? Yeah, I'm just going to say success there because I'm not going into that story. And we got a number of developer updates, most of which looked fairly good. Even if their willingness to significantly deviate from Vampire the Masquerade did make me raise a few eyebrows, we also got our first look at some actual gameplay. And apart from a few minor bugs, and a somewhat disconcerting lean towards third-person animations, it all seemed pretty good. All of that said, I did start to have a number of questions about the game prime among these was how is this game actually a Bloodlines sequel? After all, the game doesn't follow on from the story of Bloodlines, it's set in a completely different city to Bloodlines, and doesn't have any of the characters from Bloodlines, with one exception. So how exactly do you call this a sequel? It just seems to me that for something to be a sequel it needs to actually follow on from something in the original game, otherwise it's just another game set in the same world. Anyway, on the 16th of October 2019, Bloodlines 2's release date was put back to late 2020. 
and I think initially most people were okay with this. I know that I certainly was. After all, I could remember the shocking state in which Bloodlines had been released, and I don't know how many games I've seen since come out that simply weren't ready for release. It's not like there aren't plenty of examples. So ultimately, if Hard Suit Labs needed more time to produce a quality product, that was fine with me. Following this announcement, we started to see the first chinks in Bloodlines 2's armour. Of course, there'd already been the epic game store sale fiasco, something of a non-story in reality. We started getting gameplay videos from various sources, many of which showed off significant bugs within the game. These ranged from minor things like unsynchronised animations, giving us entertaining things like the self-cocking pump-action shotgun, to what seemed to be far more significant problems with the AI that resulted in NPCs detecting the player and firing at them, despite being a level below them and having a concrete flaw between the two of them. I remember seeing one video in particular exemplified this. It seemed like the journalist playing the game hadn't known how to use the controller, although now looking back I wonder whether it was the journalist or the game itself. That video in particular had featured female NPCs speaking with male voices, which I was never quite certain whether it was actually a bug or a result of what they were trying to do with the character creation system. Personally, most of my questions were still on the narrative side. Questions like how the hell are they going to get us to go from a thin blood vampire to a pure blood kindred? I mean, sure, it's possible in Vampire the Masquerade. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, there's only one way to do it, and that's something called Diablery. Diablery is where a kindred exsanguinates another kindred to the point where they can consume their soul, killing them. Now, ignoring the moral implications of having the protagonist character murder another kindred in cold blood, Diablery is generally considered to be a breach of the traditions, and as such, doing so is generally going to come with an instant death sentence. And it's not like the signs of Diablery are hard to spot. Any kindred with a moderate level of the Auspex discipline need only perform a quick aura reading of you and spot those little black veins, and then you get a very final visit from the Sheriff. There are many other questions I could ask about the design choices made for this game, but those are outside of the scope of this video, so I'll move on. Between the previous and the next major announcement, developer updates would slow to a trickle before finally stopping entirely. In fact, the only things I can remember happening between these two announcements was a bit of controversy over the inclusion of trigger warnings within the game that resulted in people calling for the firing of Kara Ellison, the only other event of any great note was the reveal of fan-favourite character Damsel from Bloodlines return in Bloodlines 2, with her beret that seems to have been plonked on her head as an afterthought. However, even this announcement managed to land with a deafening thud. This was largely as the result of two factors. Firstly, fans complained that the character bed only the most passing resemblance to the character from the first game, and while there was certainly an argument to be had over the 15 years of technological development between the two games, I do feel I have to generally agree with with that assessment. Certainly the facial structure bears no resemblance whatsoever, and most of the similarities that did exist came from superficial factors like the clothing and hair. In fact, the great irony here is that the one physical feature that they actually got correct, Damsel's deathly pallid skin, which would be incredibly unusual to have skin that pale even amongst the kindred, is probably the one physical feature that should actually be changed on Damsel. As for any kindred to have skin that pale, would have to have undergone a significant humanity loss, to the point where they would be nearly bestial in nature, which Damsel is clearly not. The other thing that I noticed about the damsel model that was shown off is it seemed to be significantly less detailed than many of those shown off previously for Bloodlines 2, and I think this is possibly where some of the second complaint came from as many fans claimed the damsel was only included at the last minute as an attempt to maintain flagging enthusiasm for the game. Personally, I'm not convinced by this argument. I suspect this complaint was more the result of the exacerbation felt within the fan base, especially as I have heard Brian Mitsord on multiple occasions express his fondness for this character. Anyway, back to our little story. On the 11th of August 2020, it was announced that Bloodlines 2 was delayed yet again, this time to 2021. This announcement really just confirmed what many people already suspected, that the game was in development hell. Either that, or Hardsuit really were so dedicated to creating a sequel that was like the original, they were willing to incorporate its development hell as well. Unfortunately, things were only going to get worse, but at least we only had to wait 8 days for the next announcement. And so, on the 19th of August 2020, we got the news everyone had been waiting for. Brian Mitsoda and Kai Clooney were both fired. The lead narrative designer and creative director both gone. Now I feel it needs to be said here. A large proportion of the fan base put their faith and trust in Brian Mitsoda. They didn't put it in Hard Suit Labs and they didn't put it in Paradox. Brian Mitsoda had been part of the team that delivered Bloodlines, and the fan base put their faith in him to deliver Bloodlines too. And as a result, when he was simply unceremoniously booted out the door, they were unsurprisingly outraged. I'll be honest and say I don't think I have ever seen a fan base turn on a game as quickly as this. A few days after this announcement, Brian Mitsoda put out a statement. 
In this statement, Brian essentially stated that after five years of working on the project, he was suddenly terminated without warning, and that as far as he was concerned, the narrative work that his team and he had done had not led to any of the problems the game was currently facing. He also talked about promoting the game and how it was immensely difficult for him, and about the fingerless gloves that he always wears, which are, quote, armour for him against his social anxieties. He also went on to express how much the Bloodlines fandom has meant to him, and about how the expectations of the fan base, as well as working with people who had started as fans of the original game had kept him going over those long five years. Brian also talked about how he was extremely disappointed and frustrated that he would not be able to see the game through to the end, a sentiment that I'm sure most of us can empathise with. And finally he stated that he did not know when Bloodlines 2 would release, but hoped the game would be as satisfying to the fans as he had intended it to be, and then thanked the fans for the support they had shown him. Now I've never met Brian Mitsoda or spoken to him in any way, but from the interviews that I'd seen of him, he always came across as a fairly decent guy, and as a result I believe him when he said his firing came as a shock. After all, Brian didn't actually need to say anything. Personally, I would just like to say this. Thank you, Brian, for everything you have done and everything you have attempted to do, even though it has clearly not been easy for you. Now, I only became aware of this while researching this video, but on the 14th of September 2020, a now-deleted review of Hardsuit Labs was posted on the website Glassdoor. Glassdoor is a website where, among other things, employees can anonymously review companies which they have and currently work for. Now, the review from the 14th of September 2020 was rather scathing. It essentially stated that the management of Hardsuit Labs were incompetent, and that the company itself has absolutely no idea how to make an RPG. Now, this review was posted by a senior games designer, and the fact that they mentioned an RPG, as well as stating that Paradox were half in and half out on the project, would all but confirm they were working on Bloodlines 2. As this review has been deleted, I had to go around the houses a bit to find a screenshot of it, but I was able to find one on a Reddit post, which I compared to the original YouTube video that I'd seen talking about this review. Now, both in this video and on the original Reddit post where I found the screenshot, it was suggested that this review may have been placed by either Kara Ellison, Kai Clooney or even Brian Mitsoda. While it is unlikely we will ever know for certain, I think it is unlikely that it was placed by any of them. This is primarily due to the fact that within the review itself it literally says firings have made the news and while necessary could have been avoided through vetting when hiring. As far as I am aware the only firings that made the news were Brian Mitsoda's and Kai Clooney's. However this statement could just as easily apply to Kara Ellison or all three of them. Personally, I would say it is irrelevant who actually posted the review. What I think is far more relevant is that a member of staff at Hardsuit Labs, a senior games designer no less, was willing to post this review at all. It certainly doesn't indicate that there is a healthy working environment at Hardsuit Labs, or that the company has generated any loyalty from its staff. And this seems to be corroborated when you look at many of the other Glassdoor reviews. Hardsuit Labs has had significant layoffs in recent months, due to events we shall be covering shortly, and as a result I have ignored any reviews from December of 20. 20 onwards. So once we remove a number of clearly fake five-star reviews, which literally parrot the same talking points over and over, we are left with a small number of quite critical reviews that reiterate many of the points made in the original September review, and even some of the positive reviews have critical things to say about their middle and higher management. Now previously I mentioned that many people felt that Kara Ellison may have posted this review. Now the main reason many people thought this would come in October of 2020, when it was discovered that Kara had departed the development team in September. Now there is no evidence to back up this claim, only the coincidental fact that both events took place in September, which is hardly indisputable proof. I feel one does have to ask the question however, did Kara Ellison jump or was she pushed? Now personally, although I have no evidence to back this up, I suspect that she was fired at the same time as Brian Mitsoda and Kai Clooney, or if not very shortly thereafter, and I feel that Hardsuit Lab made a deal with Kara Ellison for PR purposes. The main reason that I think this is that Kara Ellison was already back in Scotland by the time this news broke, and you simply do not relocate from Seattle back to Scotland in a couple of weeks, not in the middle of a global pandemic. However, regardless of how it actually happened, the result was largely the same. Both lead writers were now gone, the creative director was now gone, and both Paradox and Hardsuit Labs had gone to complete radio silence. Now before I move on to the final events of our little story, there's a few things I'd like to talk about. 
For those of you who are not familiar with World of Darkness as a setting, and with Vampire the Masquerade in particular, the game concentrates on the night-to-night existence of the Kindred, and their eternal struggle to defy their more predatory nature, as well as the personal horrors they will endure. This is set against a backdrop of a darker, more exaggerated world, where Gothic-style architecture can be found intermingled with the glass and concrete of skyscrapers, where the Kindred's secret society, known as the Camarilla, engage in almost constant political intrigue, espionage, and betrayal, all the while trying to maintain the masquerade and remain hidden from humanity. Now obviously I'm glossing over an awful lot there. I haven't even mentioned the Anarchs or the Sabbat, who are the two other major factions within the game. But it needs to be made clear that the setting is very much not, like many of the other more pop culture style supernatural series. The Kindred are not running around the streets doing whatever they want. They're not generally trying to take over the world. They don't miraculously know Kung Fu or turn into Wesley Snipes. And they don't bloody sparkle. Vampire the Masquerade, it's far more understated, more subdued. It's far closer to the writings of say HP Lovecraft than it is to Blade or Buffy. Probably the only similar movie to Vampire the Masquerade that people have heard of would be the first Underworld movie, as its depiction of the vampires and their society is quite similar to that of the Camarilla. I will mention Kindred the Embraced, the actual Vampire the Masquerade TV series, but as almost nobody has seen it, and it takes significant liberties with the setting, it is perhaps a little pointless. Now the reason I've just said all of that is so that I can discuss something which I believe was an inherent problem with this game from the beginning, which I'm going to lead into by discussing something that happened near the very end of development at Hardsuit, the appointment of Kai Clooney's replacement, Alexandria Mandrika, someone whose name I've almost certainly just mispronounced terribly. Now Alexandria previously worked at Ubisoft on amongst other projects Assassin's Creed. Now when he was initially announced many people said that he was going to turn the game into Assassin's Creed with vampires. Now this was a completely ridiculous statement for several reasons. First of all just because he'd worked on the Assassin's Creed games doesn't mean that every game he works on is going to somehow become Assassin's Creed. And the second reason that this was ridiculous was that in many respects Bloodlines 2 already was Assassin's Creed with vampires long before Alexandria ever set foot anywhere near the project. Go back and watch the gameplay footage and see how much emphasis is placed on verticality of movement and third person animations that take all control away from the player, just like the Assassin's Creed games. All that's really missing is a convoluted plot and ridiculous white robes. And believe me, I know I've played all the Assassin's Creed games up to Syndicate and I think this may be the result of a problem which existed within Bloodlines 2 right from its very origin, and that is a fundamental disconnect between the narrative side and the gameplay side. Essentially, it seems as though the narrative side of the team were creating a traditional RPG, whereas the actual game's development side seems to have been creating more of an action RPG. It also seems to me that the game's development side of the team seems to have been more inspired by various tropes taken from an assortment of vampire and supernatural TV and movie franchises than by Vampire the Masquerade itself. And judging by the recent trailer for Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt, they weren't the only ones, as that game frankly looks more like a Blade game masquerading as Worlds of Darkness. And as I have mentioned Blood Hunt, I'm going to talk about the one thing that Blood Hunt and Bloodlines both share, even though I've technically already mentioned it once. As frankly it is almost antithetical to the setting, and that is the near obsession in both games with free running and verticality of movement. Now as I previously stated, Vampire the Masquerade is quite understated. The game is literally called The Masquerade because the kindred are trying to hide from the mortal world and as a result almost anything which draws attention to the kindred like for instance being seen hurling yourself up the side of a building could very easily be treated as a breach of the first tradition the masquerade the single most important rule of the Camarilla now just for a little bit of context here in the first game bloodlines Prince Lacroix was willing to execute both you and your sire for a breach of the third tradition progeny I don't think I need to explain what they would be willing to do for a breach of the first and most important tradition. Again, the point I am trying to make here is the understated nature of the setting, which seems to be wildly at odds with much of the gameplay that's been shown off. However, that may simply be due to the fact that all the gameplay we have seen was essentially taken from a marketing demo designed to drum up sales for the game. The simple fact is, I'm not entirely convinced that Hardsuit Labs and possibly Paradox fully understood what it was they were making. That or Paradox did understand exactly what it was they were making, and that's why what happened next happened happened. However, if that is the case, I do have to question how the hell we ended up with Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt, because honestly, if you ask me to come up with the least appropriate gaming genre to make into a Vampire the Masquerade game, Battle Royale would come second only to a first-person shooter. 
Anyway, moving on. Finally, on the 23rd of February 2021, Paradox Interactive announced that Hard Suit Labs would no longer be leading the development of Bloodlines 2. Paradox simply kicked them out the door and that was it. I can only assume that what actually happened is that Hard Suit simply failed to meet so many deadlines that they violated their publisher agreement with Paradox, and that Paradox simply chose to trigger some form of termination clause in the contract. Either that, or it simply became apparent to all parties that Hard Suit's lack of institutional knowledge in development, and their specific lack of knowledge in the development of RPGs, was going to prevent them from being able to deliver the product as promised, and that both companies simply agreed to part ways. And so here we are. Bloodlines 2 is apparently still in development, despite not having a developer, has no release date, and is now more than a year over schedule. The simple fact is, I think this game has met its final death. Unfortunately, Paradox, rather like Hardsuit, lack the institutional knowledge of RPGs to be able to fix the game themselves. And the simple fact is, Paradox is a business. They know what it is likely going to cost to finish Bloodlines 2, and they know how much money it is likely to make, and those two numbers are only going to be getting closer together. So unless the pre-orders for Bloodlines 2 were so astronomical it played for the game three or four times over, I'm afraid I think the writing is on the wall. The only developer I can imagine who might be able to resurrect this game in its current state would be Obsidian Entertainment, although I have to wonder whether Obsidian or any other developer for that matter would be willing to take on this project in its current state. And speaking of other developers, on the same day it was announced that Hardsuit were booted from the project, Paradox released their 2020 end of year financial report. Within this report you will find a single paragraph referring to Bloodlines 2. And once you remove all of the corporate nonsense from this paragraph, you are left with a single line of interest, which states that Paradox have partnered with a new studio to finish Bloodlines 2. Now before you get your hopes up, I don't believe a word of this. I have seen enough of these financial reports over the years to know that these kinds of reports are aimed primarily at convincing people to invest in the company, and as such they will tend to be economical with the truth. And even if this were not the case, I can think of very few logical reasons why Paradox would keep a new developer a secret. After all, it would have looked significantly better for both Paradox and Bloodlines 2 if they could have announced that while Hardsuit Labs were no longer developing the game, another studio was. And considering the announcement and the financial report came out on the same day, it seems odd that they would not do this. All of that being said, I can think of a few reasons why they may not announce a new developer. The first, and probably second most likely of these reasons, is that the developer doesn't want their involvement to be known, at least not yet. Now I can't say exactly why a developer might feel that way, but it is possible. The second logical reason I can come up with is that the developer they have gone with has a somewhat negative reputation, or has recently gone through some sort of controversy, which they don't want tacked onto Bloodlines 2. And finally, we come to the option which I believe is most likely, that the developer simply doesn't exist. Regardless of all of this, however, if by some miracle this game does actually come out, I doubt it is going to bear any resemblance to the game that was shown off. Whether you consider that to be a positive or a negative is up to you. Sadly, I fear that whatever game does get released will be nothing more than an unfinished mess shoved out the door in the hopes of recouping some of the costs. I can't think of a single game that has been this far into development hell and recovered. If I'm honest, I can't recall another game which has been this far into development hell. As a result of this, I find it very strange that Paradox haven't actually cancelled the game. The only thing I can think of is that Paradox is trying to set aside some money from some of its other game sales so that they have enough funds available to repay the pre-orders when they finally do cancel Bloodlines 2. And this would make quite a lot of sense. A lot of people wrongly tend to assume that these big games companies have huge amounts of money just sat around doing nothing, where in reality much of their money is actually tied up in physical assets and production. As a result, the actual amount of money they have just lying around is fairly negligible. Obviously I am talking about games companies in general and not Paradox in particular. I have to say that I consider the treatment of Brian Mitsoda and others to be a deplorable disgrace. Maybe, maybe they did something wrong, but I doubt it. After reading Brian Mitsoda's statement, I believe that his firing was exactly the shock that he said it was, and I will go one further on that. I believe that the management at Hard Suit Labs used Brian Mitsoda, Kai Clooney and probably Kara Ellison as scapegoats to cover up for their own ineptitude, and Paradox failed to see this until it was too late. But again, I have to say, this is purely my own opinion, and speculation. I have no evidence to back any of that up. Before I say what I am about to say next, I want to make it very clear that I am something of a Paradox fanboy. I've played Hearts of Iron 4, Crusader Kings 2 and 3, Europa Universalis 3 and 4, Victoria 2, Stellaris, Imperator Rome, Battletech, City Skylines, and quite a few others. But regardless, I have to say that Paradox's handling of this entire situation has been a complete farce. 
Their response has been little more than to bury their heads in the sand and hope the entire situation goes away of its own accord. When the Worlds of Darkness franchise came into the possession of Paradox Interactive, I was overjoyed, but now frankly I wish it had just stayed in limbo. If Bloodlines 2 is dead, Paradox just say so. And if it isn't, just keep people informed, even if it's just to say we're still looking for somebody to work on the project. Not that I believe Paradox Interactive will take a blind bit of notice to anything I say. What I will say is this, I wish Brian Mitsoda, Kai Clooney and yes, Cara Ellison, all the best for the future. If we assume for a moment that Paradox Interactive haven't simply washed their hands of Bloodlines 2, and that they aren't simply postponing its cancellation until they have the money to cover the costs, we have to ask the question what does the future hold for this game? And personally, I think that depends entirely on Paradox Interactive's view of the Worlds of Darkness franchise. If they view the franchise as nothing more than an IP farm of brand names, that they can simply rent out to anyone with a game to slap the name on, and that is certainly how it looks at the moment, we will probably get a Bloodlines 2 that is nothing more than a cash grab, a minimum effort title shoved out the door to recoup the costs. If Paradox Interactive view the Worlds of Darkness as a potential major franchise, however, then they simply cannot allow their flagship game and centrepiece of their efforts to go down in flames before it's even been released. And unfortunately, I have no idea how Paradox actually view this franchise. They've given off far too many mixed messages to be able to make anything more than a wild guess. I think ultimately the writing is on the wall here. This game was doomed to fail before it even entered production. It wouldn't have mattered how good the storyline might have been, or what political messaging may or may not have been in the game, or what gameplay features the game may or may not have had. The simple fact is, Hardsuit Labs never had the ability to implement the game in the first place, and Paradox lacked the necessary knowledge of RPG creation to be able to see that things were going wrong at Hardsuit. Many people, myself included in this, simply rationalised many of the worrying signs that we saw. Ultimately, I cannot and will not tell you whether you should still have hope for this game. That's a decision you're going to have to make on your own. All I can tell you for certain is, I don't. It's taken me close to a month to make this video, and put the launch of my YouTube channel back by almost as long. Not for any technical reasons. I just didn't really want to make this video, at least not the way it is. I wanted to find something... something positive to say, some ray of hope. But if there is one out there, I couldn't find it. And believe me, I looked. Unfortunately, almost everything I discovered while researching this video simply convinced me that this game is even more dead than I thought it was. I truly hope that almost everything I have said in this video is wrong. And I hope that Bloodlines 2 comes out and is a great success, and is everything the fan base want it to be. But hope is not a strategy for success. There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope.